Oh, maybe. Are you there, Malcolm? <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yeah, can hear you. Do you want I'm me here. to open the? You want me to open the meeting? Well, I can op open the meeting and hand it over to you. Okay. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Today's Board of Health is now officially open. Uh, we have a quorum president. One member will not be with us. I will be by Zoom. Uh, just to remind you all, this is uh, going to be recorded both audio and visually. Uh, any roll calls will have to be taken individually since I am now on Zoom. And I'm going to head the head and the uh, chairmanship over to uh, Meredith Lepre since she's in the room and it would be a lot easier uh, for her to manage the meeting. So take it away. Do I have to do a roll call of who's here? Yes. Okay, so uh, members that are present by roll call, Anne? Here. Malcolm? Yes. Jimmy? Here. And I'm here. Um, next would be any public announcements? Yep, public comment. Oh, it says public, in oh, just that this meeting is being audio. Okay, public comment? Not anything that's not on the agenda? Okay. Um, Approval of the minutes. I make a motion oh. to accept. Second. All right. All in favor, Anne? Aye. Malcolm? Aye. Jimmy? Aye. Uh, and I was not here for the 321, so I will um, say aye to the 3 4, but not abstain from the 321 2024 meeting minutes. Um, next is to lift the condemnation of 7 Lily Street. Yeah, so I've been in contact with the property owner for this. Um, he hired uh, River Hawk Environmental for all the cleanup work, which I uh, witnessed all their reports um, and also received all the receipts for from the plumber installing a new boiler uh, for everything. Uh, everything in the basement's cleaned up. If you recall, this one had a bit of an oil spill in the basement. Um, I think this was on the February agenda, but um, I've been provided all the documentation and witnessed all the reports to, uh, I feel comfortable that we're good to lift the condemnation on this. So we need a motion. And I apologize, I didn't want to include the receipts in the, in the packet, and, and so uh, that's why nothing was on the packet for this. What do you need? Just a motion to accept? Yeah, motion to lift the condemnation. Uh, I the, make the motion to lift it. All right. Second. All in favor? Ann? Uh, yes. Jimmy? Aye. Malcolm? Aye. And I say aye. Uh, next is 35 Warren's Landing Septic Setbacks from the Madigan Regulation Code of Town and Nantucket, Chapter 303. You want me to start, John? Oh, sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, we have uh, the applicant, Don Bracken, from Bracken Engineering here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, also, I'm, I'm here with the, my client, Jennifer Tuesday, who uh, has the property under agreement to purchase. Um, I would, if it's okay, just like to give you some handouts, um, highlighted plans. It's not really new information. I think it's just going to help follow along. Yeah. 
You know, as stated in our variance request letter, um, we're here seeking uh, setback variances from the Medicare regulations um, in order to uh, design a new septic system for this newly created covenant lot. Um, I'll start by saying that the existing lot um, had a four bedroom main house that's off the sheet there that you can't see, has a garage that you can see at the top left-hand corner with one bedroom, has a two-bedroom existing house that's now shown on the newly created 20,000 square foot covenant lot. Uh, what we're proposing is for the lot to be sold off, that a new individual septic system be installed for the two existing two-bedroom lot with an IA system and two-bedroom soil absorption system, that the existing septic system that serves this two-bedroom cottage and the one-bedroom garage that exists between the two structures, as you can see on the plan, that that be converted um, to a one-bedroom system um, in that one of the leaching trenches that's closer to the proposed lot line would be abandoned. The reason why, why we're doing that is because that leaching trench doesn't meet Title V setbacks. It's less than 10 feet. Um, and before I go any deeper, I'd like to go through some background, I think, on the, on the Madigan regulations. As you, as you know, we've been here several times at our office, the Madigan variances, and you know, probably we've lost more than we've won, I'd have to say. Um, so that sort of prompted me to really kind of dig into the regulations, and I've brought it up at several past meetings. Um, the, first, the first plan, all I simply did was I took a section of the plan that was submitted with all that information in this very, very busy plan to try to simplify the discussion for this particular lot. If you go to the second sheet, um, our office prepared a plan which shows a comparison of what was the original Madiket area, uh, which is shown here in blue, specifically as it was written in the regulations, which were written in 1973, 50 years ago. Then, subsequently, the Madiket watershed area was created, as we all know. All new regulations were incorporated for that. And in 2021, the Board of Health voted to modify the Madiket area related to these variances for setbacks and distance between reserve area and primary area to include the watershed area. And so more out of just curiosity, we decided to take a look at the two areas to see what the implications were. And a lot of this is generated, and you, I'll get to it, about any future creation of covenant lots. So the area increased from about 600 acres to about 2,300 acres, roughly four times the size. So now think of it, a regulation that was written in 1973, in which case back then, in 1973, you could have a 750-gallon septic tank, and you only needed 50 feet between the well and the septic system. Not to mention that back then, septic systems were leaching pits about eight feet in diameter. And somehow, the same regulation is carried forth after all the changes that we've gone through in Title V, after you know, everything else that's occurred regarding septic systems since then. So the, the, re, the other reason I point out this map is that it took me about a month, but I was able to get from DEP their list of, which is shown on the next page, eight and a half by 11, all the regulations followed with the central register. Now, you'll notice it appears that in 2001, all the regulations were submitted 
to be put on record. We don't know, if, you know, what was done prior to that, but, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just pointing that out. But one, one thing um, that you'll notice on this list is that in 2021, when the area changed, quadrupled in size, there's nothing on record at the state with the central register. Now, that's sort of significant. It's not to say that your office can't go down and send it to the central register tomorrow and then it becomes effective, but you know, it, you know, it's, it's just something to discuss. So obviously, uh, in, in my opinion, because the Board of Health at that time didn't follow proper procedure, and it's been three years, it's not like it was a few months ago, you know, I would question whether or not these regulations are applicable to the new area. So the last section that I've handed you is, which I'm, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with, is Chapter 111, Section 31. This is the uh, Mass General Law that gives the Board of Health authority to create their own regulations uh, in addition to Title V. Obviously, they don't make them less strict, they're more strict. And then if you go, I have two highlighted areas, but if you go to the last page, I've highlighted the area that I just referred to that states that any adoptions, regulations, or amendments you know, shall be sent to the central register. Now, of course, it doesn't go on to say what happens if it's not, so. But I'd like to take you back to that same document that's uh, page two that's highlighted, and I think it's important to see, because you've probably sensed my frustration in the past six months, of, you know, some, at some point when, you know, trying to get these variances. You know, I'm going to read it, because it says, prior to the adoption of any such regulation or amendment, which exceeds the minimum requirements of subsurface disposal of sanitary sewage, as provided by the State Environmental Code, a Board of Health shall state at said public hearing the local conditions which exist or reasons for exceeding such minimum requirements. Now let's go back. These regulations were in 1973. Obviously, we're not going to know what was stated at that meeting. But I think it's still imperative that if these regulations that were adopted then, that this current board can somehow you know, justify or state exactly what the state law requires. Like what makes, you know, Medicaid alone a special condition to protect groundwater, environment, quality, all those things that it requires a 50 foot setback from a property line. That it also requires a 15 foot separation between primary areas and reserve areas. You know, that's, that's a question I don't expect anybody to answer now on their feet, but I think that we all deserve that answer. If you're, you know, if this board is sitting here making these decisions, I, I would hope that there would be, you know, some basis, not just for the fact that it's new construction, it's a new lot, we just don't grant variances. So in our variance request, I also referenced the specific Board of Health Regulation 303-5.4, right? That allows this Board of Health to grant variances. Now, it specifically says that the variance can be granted if the same degree of protection can be achieved without strict application of the setback requirements. And in my professional opinion, you know, with you know, over 30 years of designing septic systems, I, can't, I still can't correlate how when we ask for this variance, we don't meet that requirement. In other words, what is the argument that, no, this isn't, uh, you know, it doesn't have the same degree of environmental protection because it's closer to the lot line, yet, you know, Yet, you know, these, these variances get denied, you know, and 
We never get an explanation that contradicts our opinion that the same degree of environmental protection can be achieved. <clears throat> so I think now going back to the first sheet, again, the plan, you know, you can see that we're proposing a 20 foot setback to the property line. So we're asking 30 feet of relief there. We're proposing that the prime area and the reserve area be next to each other. And so we're requesting relief to the 15 foot uh, bearing, uh, requirement in that, in that sense. So we are providing an IA system. If you look at this project overall, it's an overall improvement with the IA separate system for the two bedroom cottage, which will be deed restricted and limited you know, um, two, two bedrooms uh, recorded at the Registry of Deeds. Overall, there's an environmental benefit. You know, I think there's no doubt we didn't submit nitrogen loading calculations, but obviously with the IA and no increase in the number of bedrooms, there'll be a reduction. You know, without these variances, then this, the, the plan that created the covenant lot, I think just goes back on the shelf. The only other alternative would be a shared system putting in a new system, shared system. And I think the purpose of the covenant lot is not to add additional expenses. And I think, you know, my own experience with shared systems and this board's experience with shared systems, especially, you know, in, in, in Madikit, Tristan's Landing, if a shared system can be avoided and something like this can be improved, approved in its place, I, I think that obviously is the most realistic approach. And, and um, I probably said too much already, but hopefully I, <laughs> it was clear enough. No one ever said septic systems are easy. So be happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Do you have any questions? No. <laughs> Why you? Okay. I guess I do actually. I guess my question is, what harm? Um, I don't feel like I understand what harm would come from um, from changing this. Uh, what what are we actually worried about? Uh, we're worried about groundwater. Uh, I think the historically or uh, previously uh, the groundwater or the water in Madikit. Uh, was poor poor uh, water quality. Uh, I think those regulations affecting Madikit, which uh, set for the 50 foot um, property setback for soil absorption systems and the 100 foot well radius was, uh, you know, to cut down on the amount of bedrooms in Madikit and therefore cutting down on the number of, you know, size of soil absorption systems in Madikit to try and help preserve the, the groundwater there. Um, and then, of course, uh, the addition of um, IA systems um, being incorporated, but the uh, Madica Harbor watershed. Well, you know, if I may add, add, so obviously this is, add, that's another reason I did the map, because this location is a lot different than the original Madica area, which a lot of, most of that has town water at the moment. You know, the water quality here for well water is, is good. It's not like the old quality, you know, from Madigan when these regulations were written. And, you know, this, the expanded area is no different than the rest of the town, right? So it's, 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 it's hard to, to say, I think, you know, to be consistent across the town, how this particular area at this site is any different than, you know, some other area in town. And I think, and we also watched the 2021 um, uh, video of that meeting, and there was concerns about the increased size of the uh, district. And I believe the reaction at that point was, well, then we'll look at it on a case-by-case -case basis when applicants come in. I think this is a clear example of a case-by-case -case basis where I think that there should be some wiggle room with this regulation. Let me ask a question. Would a shared system solve the problem? Um, a shared system, yeah, yes, could solve the problem. But 
I I don't see why we would want to look at a shared system with all its complications and financial commitments and so forth when we have a perfectly viable situation where this situation, I would, you know, I can't see how this impacts the groundwater, whether it's 50 feet or 20 feet, any, any, any more than if we could meet the 50 feet. Well, my, my next question would be, if it's a viable system, why would you need a variance? It might be viable to some people, but it's not viable to everybody. If you have a shared system, you have to have uh, you have to set up an account to replace that system. Mm -hmm. That's added money, right? Yeah. It, in, and I already mentioned about the, the problem with shared system. One person they're trying to get people to agree when the system does have to be replaced or does have to be ma maintained. You know, I don't think anybody here would want to be in that situation of having to share a system. And this is putting in an AI system, which is better for the environment, correct? Well, it, yeah, and it would be required at the trans, you know, for the transfer no matter what. So we're not. And it's essentially just moving half of that over to the over the property line right like you're shutting down half of that of the one that's attached to the one car garage and putting in a new one on the other side of the property right so the new one is just for the two bedroom house that's going to be in the covenant line uh, Alcom is his hand up oh, uh, uh, can you go, Malcolm? Can you hear us? Yeah, I had uh, two questions. One, I think shared systems are not, there's a lot of problems with shared systems. I'm not sure we gain much for it. This does seem a bit environmentally sound. But let's go back to your, your comments about uh, the regulations not being filed. Do we have a legal issue here? I'd need to look into that with the EP. I mean, that was supplied by the applicant, so I would need to look into that. But this information was just provided this morning, so. Yeah, I noticed that, but I think we need, going forward, we need to look at, we need a legal opinion from our attorney about that. Yeah. <clears throat> I would agree with that. And on the other hand, I would also agree that even if we we still need the variance, we meet the merits of getting a variance. So hopefully we can get through here tonight without waiting for that. Even though obviously that's something that needs to be done. Yeah, we need. To, could you just move a little closer to the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. I I said I would hope that even if the regulations are not applicable to this project, and you get a legal uh, interpretation of that. I would hope that we could still go forward tonight and get these variances just based on its own merits. I'm personally comfortable with a variance. What did he say? He's comfortable with yeah. a variance. So my, <clears throat> my question as usual is if we agree to do this, give them a variance, how does it affect Everyone else have to come yeah. down the line. Well, as the applicant said, I mean, you're going to have to look at all of those on a case by case basis. So, you know, I would caution the board a little bit in that regard. Um, if you're leaning towards an approval, I would, you know, maybe suggest make sure you're specific on why this would be granted. I mean, because Matic is the way Matic it is, and if if one person gets something like this. And I'm not saying it, it's wrong or it's right, but what about yeah. the next five or six or seven people coming down that are in the same situation? They'll come in, and if you grant a variance to this person, you, you're obligated to do the same for the next one. I think sometimes when we're asked to put in variances, it's for an AI system with a million bedrooms, well, like 10 bedroom, a 10 bedroom system or a 12 bedroom system, and this is 
literally just moving it to the other side of the property because I'm not usually a, a big fan of variances, but I think this one is just a two bedroom. It's not making it any bigger. It's not giving them any more bedrooms. And it's literally because there's a property line there. So it's just putting it on the other side of the property line so that they each property has their own septic rather than having to share it. Oh, Madam Chair, I guess I'd have two comments. Um, I think it was back in 2006 or seven when uh, the Madigan Harbor watershed was all was uh, approved uh, in conjunction with DEP. So um, it was a collaboration of establishing all of this, um, which incorporated the uh, regulations affecting Madiket, which is uh, the 50 foot property line setback for the soil absorption system. Um, and I believe in 2015, that was all approved in the comprehensive wastewater uh, management plan by DEP that was approved as well. Um, you know, with that said, gauging how the board goes, maybe you set the limit on number of bedrooms in these kind of cases when you're when you're considering this scenario three or less or two or less or you know so see that involves the individual case because we're not talking about a lot of bedrooms here i think Meredith said it well I, i'm richard glenn i represent mrs tuesdale who's the contract purchaser of the property and i'm not a septic expert by any means but it seemed to me that when the day is done, there's a there's a four bedroom house, a cottage, and a barn that are there. When it's done, there's going to be a four bedroom house, a cottage, and a barn. There's going to be one of the two systems are going to be replaced with an IA system, which is clearly an upgrade. And the only thing that's going to change is lines on a piece of paper. We're not. It's it's it, there's no environmental yeah. degradation by allowing this. And if someone else next door neighbor or person 10 yards down the street or someone else in that comes in and they have an, I, I, a situation like this, then I think they'd be entitled to a variance. But if they don't, that's why you have a board so you guys can differentiate when the hell you need a variance and when one's justified. In this case, I think it's clearly justified. My client contracted, there's nothing to do with this, but it does, it does impact. She contracted to buy this five months ago went to the planning board, they got the covenant done. She went to Cape Cod Five, got financing approved for the covenant house, which is what the island supposedly is trying to do. She then, we then discovered that because of the lot line, the septic system wasn't on the lot of the cottage, so we have to move it or do a new one. So we went through all these gyrations and decided to build a new two bedroom system with IA components and put a deed restriction on the cottage that there'd never be more than two bedrooms. So again, it it clearly, in my opinion, meets the criteria for variance. And it that's why the, the regulation was written as it is to give you guys the authority in appropriate circumstances to give a variance. And I think this is a certainly an appropriate circumstance. Thank Madam you. Madam Chair. Uh, yes. Yes, Malcolm. May I make a motion? Yes, please. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the variance. What was the motion? Approve the variance. So you need a second for that. Right. I'll second it. All in favor? Yes. Okay. Malcolm? Yes. No. No. And I say yes. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, next up is 35 Warren's Landing septic loan request. <laughs> uh, she can't, let's see. Um, sorry, let's see if I can bring that up if you need to view that, but obviously I think you know what's going on here. So who's going to speak on this? 
Okay, so here's, here's the application that was submitted um, by the applicant here. Um, and the request is, uh, looks like 50,800. Sorry, 57,800, I was corrected there. Okay, do we have any? Recommendations or? Uh, let's see. Obviously, this was contingent on the approval of the the variance, which you just granted. So um, here is more of a write up in here. Uh, so they're actually requesting 150 um, percent, which I think is required by the bank mm -hmm. to show that. So. That's, uh, I mean, these are the types of things that have been approved in the past a lot by the board. So um, we've had other new property owners in this situation where they were granted that. Do we want to, do you want to speak, did you want to speak or no? I just wanted to make sure I was here if you needed anything from me. Any comments from the board? Can I just say one thing? Sure. So I've been coming to Nantucket for 51 years as a renter. And um, I just want to thank uh, all of the boards and all of the planning groups that have helped me to uh, be approved for a covenant lot. To be, you know, everybody has held my hand through this very confusing situation. Um, and I just feel really blessed to have been granted a covenant lot and to now be granted the variances. And um, this would just make my kids' dream come true and my dream come true to be able to move forward. So thank you very much. So do we have a motion? I move to approve the um, loan for the septic system at 35 Warren's Landing. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right. And what do you vote? Oh, yes. Yes. Ann? Yes. Malcolm? Aye. Yes. And I say yes. Next is Six Woodland Drive Nitrogen Loading Credit. Uh, I don't see anyone here for that. Oh. Oh. Damn. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Dan, you should be good. All right, am I there? We can hear you. Okay, excellent. The um, doesn't look like I've got a camera working here. Sorry for that. Just check that in here. All right, for some reason I don't have a camera. Apologize for that, but Dan Malloy, site design engineering for the applicants. <clears throat> We're here before you asking for a variance for a bedroom credit. We are in, located on Six Woodland. We're in the Wellhead Protection District. Uh, there are no other wetland or environmental related factors here. Uh, we've got an over, well, we've got an 80,000 square foot lot that conventionally can accommodate eight bedrooms. We're asking for a variance to allow 10 bedrooms with an IA system. Uh, other than that, it's a fairly straightforward request, and it's something that the board has reviewed on quite a few other occasions and granted the variances. Uh, so, yep. Uh, in the wellhead, 80,000 square foot lot asking for 10 bedrooms uh, with the IA system. Um, this property all came about uh, after a discovery of uh, building a cabana building, uh, a pool cabana in the back with a bathroom, which met the definition of a studio, which meant they needed to upgrade their current system. Um, they had been denied that building permit in our office because they needed to upgrade. Um, so then we sent letters of enforcement um, and we're in the middle of litigation right now with this property. 
Um, part of that was obviously submitting the um, uh, this plan um, for the IA. And so uh, I think there's about a total of, I did a walkthrough of the property and buildings and there's about 10, be uh, 10 bedrooms on the property. So, um, you know, this would bring the property into compliance. It's kind of a uh, bad behavior situation. Um, partially of which I think the new owner inherited. Uh, but um, again, it was, there was construction going on without Board of Health approval, so. Does anyone have comments? Malcolm there. Yeah, he's here. Anyone have comments from the board? So you're saying it's not in, the whole thing's not in compliance? Uh, currently it's not in compliance, yeah. So I mean, what, what would it take to bring it up into compliance? Uh, the proposed system, which would be an IA. So it'd be um, 10 bedrooms on an 80,000 square foot lot. Right. So they're asking, uh, technically they could get uh, 12 bedrooms with an IA system on this lot, rough, you know, rough calculation, probably be 12. Um, so you know, these are the types of things that have been granted in the past by the board uh, many times in the wellhead. Um, so. You don't have any problem with it? If you do, I need to know what it is. Well, you know, we weren't happy to, about the construction that went on in the property without board of health, you know, without the health department review. Um, you know, at the same time, I, this is a, a bit of a benefit to get the IA on the on the property. So, um, you know, if, if this isn't approved, they're going to look at probably taking down some buildings. I would say uh, to get in compliance with uh, what's currently on the property for bedrooms. Malcolm. Well, I'm never happy about the. Uh, many hotels, but uh, we have done this before. And it does put them in compliance. And Would you like a motion? Yeah, I, un unfortunately, I agree with Malcolm. I think the idea of a 12 bedroom something uh, is abhorrent to me. Uh, but that's probably not our uh, purview as the Board of Health. What we have to decide is whether um, it is meeting the code as the code is written in terms of, you know, all of that. So I don't know that we can really object unless John says there's something to object to. I mean, with the design, there's nothing egregious, obviously, with the design itself. I mean, it's a compliant system. It's, um, you know, as the local regulation is for the wellhead, it's uh, one bedroom per 10,000. Um, IA systems, you know, nitrogen reducing systems have always allowed to uh, get credits on the 10,000 to lower uh, the square footage, the required square footage per bedroom. So, um, you know, it, part of it's always looked at that it's a environmental benefit because you have, you know, nitrogen loading wise, you're going down from five bedrooms to what could be eight bedrooms. Um, you know, that's everything's always uh, measured in nitrogen in Title V. So um, by Title V, they're, you know, it's a, it's a benefit. Um, I don't think it's a, it is always a benefit based on, you know, other past pathogens and you know more usage and and what's really going into the ground and everything so um, I think those are maybe things to consider in the future moving forward I think it's a little frustrating that we keep getting things from the building department because they are not doing things correctly and it's uh, ask for forgiveness instead of permission so I know I watched last month's meeting and Carrie made that comment that this is happening every month um, like this is not brand new construction because I've walked by this house. So it was new construction. Sorry. In uh, the last like 
couple of years, uh, like two years. It's, I yeah, guess it's, I feel like we're, they're asking permission now that they, they went and did what they wanted to do and now are asking for permission to do what they did. So that is right. correct. Yep, yeah. they, they did build this uh, cabana building. I guess that's what you call it uh, up by the pool which I think had a full bath or maybe only a half bath, um, but still meets our local definition of a studio, which you know, is the equivalent of one bedroom of required septic capacity for the soil absorption system. So, um, and correct, yes, that was done without uh, review by the health department. I don't know if they even received a building permit to tell you the truth. Can I just add a few, just a quick, history on some of this stuff, just so everybody's clear, excuse me, how we got to this point, well, at least on some of it. Uh, when, the, when the current owners bought the property, there were already eight to nine bedrooms existing on the, on the property. And the, the new work they did do, which John is completely correct, that they did construct a pool cabana in the back and added a bedroom. And that was done without Board of Health review. Uh, so that was clearly not correct. Uh, so there were previously eight to nine bedrooms. There's no, I say eight to nine because there are no definitive plans as to what previously existed here. They're very, the, the file for this is very limited. Uh, so eight to nine was existing and the cabana certainly qualifies as a bedroom. And that brings us up to 10. So what you have before you is a design for 10 bedrooms to accommodate everything that was previously there, as well as the construction of the cabana. So there definitely was a violation here, but it's not, it's not to the full extent uh, of what it sounds like. It's only 10 bedrooms, not 12. Malcolm, move your hand up. What, what benefit? Uh, I make a motion. Sorry. What, what were you saying? What benefit do, do we get out of this by, by giving him, uh, let him have 66, 87 square feet versus 86, 13 square feet as far as, do we, do we get anything, Board of Health get any benefit out of this at all? Um, we get an IA system, you know, going from what could be eight bedrooms on a conventional down to five with the IA based on nitrogen loading. So that would be the benefit, the so reduction in nitrogen. There is a benefit, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, my ask would be, this has gone on since last May, I think, is when the enforcement letter first went out. And, uh, you know, we're looking to see this in the ground as fast as possible if it's approved. Malcolm? No, I think, I think we've all expressed our opinions. I think we really... Uh, we do get an environmental benefit. There's there's no reason that that we could have to uh, deny this request. Did you want to make a motion? Sure, I will. I will move that uh, we approve the nitrogen credit for Six Woodland Drive. What was the motion? Approve the nitrogen credit for Six Woodland Drive. Is there a second? Which, which is essentially an IA system, which is putting an IA si a system. That should be part of the motion. It has to be done with an IA system. That That is the proposal. That's an IA. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll agree to that. All right. All in favor? Yes. Sir. Yes. You second, and yeah. you say yes. Anne? Yeah. Malcolm? Aye. And I say aye. Thank you. Next is Kitty Murtaugh's variant request for insula insulation of the floor drain. Madam Chair, Michael Wilson on behalf of your applicant, uh, Mr. Keene, doing business as Kitty's. Um, we have not had the opportunity to address Head and his concerns. I'm asking if the board would consider postponing this hearing one month so that Mr. Keene can be present and we can follow up with 
what we've been discussing and what Mr. Keene has been discussing with the health department on the floor drain. Okay. Do you need to take a vote on that? Yeah, okay. you should make them. Okay. Anyone want to make a motion to, or do we just have to vote on? Yeah, motion okay. to continue to. Motion to, to continue. Like a motion continue to continue. One month, please. For one month. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Anne? Yes. Malcolm? Aye. Aye. Timmy? And I say aye. Thank you very much. See you in a moment. Okay. Um, variance request for Nantucket Beach Dogs from the bathroom requirement. Hi, everybody. I'm Jack Decker, um, owner of Nantucket Beach Dogs. I've been working out there selling hot dogs since 2011. Excuse me, Madam Chair, could you have the person speak closer to the microphone? Yes. yes. So I'm here today, um, you know, we've had a couple meetings revolved around the land bank applying for the three licenses to be out at Cisco, which have been denied um, for various reasons, you know, the erosion out there for the brick and mortar bathrooms, tough one to work around as well as the mobile bathroom. Um, but so with that said, I have in my proposal here, a potential solution to the problem, which would be to purchase and set up a temporary hand washing station which will have hot water. They'll have a bucket underneath to collect it with a lid so I can bring it back to my commissary, dispose of it at the end of the day. And it, it looks just like that. It's a Cambro brand and it's got the capabilities to insulate and keep water warm for up to four hours and has soap, napkin holder, and hopefully we can uh, get a variance. So yeah, obviously this was all spoke about a lot last meeting. Um, and at that time, you know, feeling from the department is that the, the card is less, a lot less impact uh, in regard that it's a uh, very limited handling of food. It's outside. Um, he's proposing the, or the applicant's proposing the, um, the hand washing station, which should be outside of the bathroom. Um, the variance would be from the local uh, regulation uh, regarding bathrooms that no temp, uh, chemical toilet should be installed for a food establishment. So um, so they're seeking the variance for that. Um, you know, with that said, uh, you know, we feel this should be taken on a case by case basis based on really the amount of preparation, food handling, cook steps, and everything that would be involved with this. Uh, as the applicant stated, uh, he's been at Cisco for many years, um, has a good track record with inspections and everything, and, and based on the, the limited uh, food handling, we think it's something the board could consider for approval, so. So this is completely different from the land bank? This is at Cisco Beach at the land bank property. So it's- No, no, I'm saying we turned the land bank down for what they wanted. How does this affect with what we turned the land bank down for? Um, well, it'd be on a case by case basis for each individual food establishment to apply for. So instead of a blanket, more or less a blanket approval to the land bank to allow all food trucks there. Um, it's really the responsibility of the individual food establishment to apply uh, for a variance um, from the, the local regulation. So um, this is really a case by case scenario with each food establishment, so. You okay with this? I think, it, you know, based on, you know, the past and past inspections and everything, the limited uh, food handling, um, the proposed hand washing station to be outside of the, the bathroom there, um, I, I think it's something the board could consider for approving. Any other yeah. comments? As I understood it from last time, um, one of the reasons that we're willing to consider this variance is that there's really no preparation of food. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, 
most food trucks, I mean, most all the preparation needs to happen in their base of operations. Um, there's just no real finishing off of food in this step. You know, there's not adding like lettuce and tomato to a cheeseburger or something or um, handling really potentially hazardous food. Um, you know, the, the hot dogs are steamed and handled with tongs and, and gloves. Um, it's outdoors, so they're, you know, the applicant's not tracking in, you know, contaminants from the porta potty, which obviously we don't feel is a sanitary bathroom, toilet facility for a food establishment. Um, you know, with that said, he's, he's outdoors, so not enclosed and uh, bringing in anything into the food well, truck. My question is, why is he here looking for variance? Yes. Well, what, what he's been, he didn't need a variance for all the years he's been doing. Um, yeah, it, I mean, that was part of last month's meeting. It was, um, you know, the proliferation of food established, uh, mobile food establishment. Okay. It, right. it was okay. just, you know, I can't completely comment to the past, you know, health okay. department. I just think, um, perhaps it was an oversight or it was, you know, not a, con a concern based on the, the limited food handling with the. Right. Malcolm. I have no problem with this. I think it encompasses the spirit of what we were trying to get at before. And as John pointed out, he doesn't seem to have a great, uh, great deal of difficulty with this. I can support this. So does anyone want to make a motion? I make a motion to approve the variance. Is there a second? All right, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Mr. Cooper? And yes. Malcolm? Aye. And I say aye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Next up, Nantucket Hotel variance request from natural light requirement. Yeah, I think the applicant's here for this. Hello, I'm Mark Snyder, the owner of the hotel. Uh, how should I proceed? Do you want to bring up the staff recommendation or should I? Um, I can bring it up just to prompt okay, them real so quick. Wondered, this was the wrong question. We changed the door. So that has been completely noticed. Okay. Um, so the long and short of this is uh, this is the Nantucket Hotel and Resorts. Their employee uh, housing, the staff housing, which is kind of basement level, kind of not. Um, and uh, was discovered on the inspection um, that, so each, by the housing code, each uh, habitable room is required to have 8% natural light. So that's, you know, 8% uh, glazing. I think it's uh, translucent light. Um, it's something that unfortunately does not align with the building code. Um, so the health, the housing code, states you know you need the eight percent so that's a window in a house or in a bedroom um so when you add up the square footage uh of the floor area eight percent of that needs to be equal to uh a window or yeah the glass um the uh building code allows instead of natural light for artificial light to make up the the required lumens or candles for uh the required lighting for a habitable room, so a bedroom, living room, uh, kitchen that's over 70 square feet. Um, so unfortunately, it's something we run into a fair amount um, based on the number of basement bedrooms we have on the island. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to consider a life safety issue. I do, you know, we do feel it's it's unfortunate not to have the eight percent light. I mean, it is the code, and that's what we enforce. Um, but uh, you know, unfortunately, with that said, the, the the building does have a CO through the building department for probably over ten years now. Um, it's something that was just missed on inspections. Um, this is the direction the state kind of steered us in uh, with regard to. A, uh, enforcement all this is to, to send it to the board for them uh, to get variances from the natural light um, and 
there was one room that was completely dark. Uh, it was all artificial light, but now the applicants uh, proposed a door with a window in it. So I can pass that around. I'm not sure if it meets 8%, but. So what percent are they at? So can I add something here? Because I completely understand regulations. We've lived by them. And what's particularly frustrating is um, this was, we've had Board of Health inspections for 12 years. We did everything properly. We're probably about half of that, but we have full illumination. The windows look out underneath our pool. So if you were to spend the thousands of dollars to retrograde, there'd be no more light because they're covered by a deck above it. And the building inspector wrote a letter and outlined that this is a real conflict between the two codes in the state. And it seems extremely unfair that we're the victim of that when we've done everything correctly for so long. And we've tried to do everything the Board of Health has asked. We fixed the one door. Uh, and that's the position we find ourselves in. Any comments from the board? I have a question. So can you move up a little bit, Jim? Right now, the building department will approve things that you won't approve. Yeah, that's based on the codes. So the housing code doesn't include anything about artificial light making up. Um, well, it doesn't matter if it's a commercial building and, and they uh, they agree to let it be a certain number. You health department won't agree, won't. Uh, that. that would be square footage. I think maybe you're referencing square footage per room. What or I'm trying to say or... is there's going to be problems between the building department and the health department. In, some way down the line unless two people get together and, and work something out in this particular part of the code yes but you know that would these are both state codes um you know where the health department were enforcing the health code I mean, and I the never health code says i never even heard of this it's you know as i said we're it's kind of a rock and a hard place where you know as yep. i said as health inspectors uh, we're told to enforce the, the housing code um, and the housing code is eight percent natural light um, you know as i said the the building code clashes and allows for the artificial light to make up um, that eight percent light uh, the required illumination of the room so um, it's a tough spot <laughs> so my so my question is are these people going to be forced to taking windows out and putting bigger windows in? That by the health code, by the housing code, correct? Yeah, that would be required. Even though they, even though they built the house according to the building mm -hmm. inspector. That's correct. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. And it's under the pool, so it wouldn't give them any more light anyway. That is correct. Uh, Malcolm. <laughs> I think it's all all been said. Uh, we've got two conflicting codes. Uh, I don't think it's fair that we should retroactively penalize someone who had approval 10 years ago. I don't see a great safety issue here or a health issue here. Maybe people like a little light, but as, they certainly, as long as they can get out of the rooms in an emergency, I have no problem in granting this variance. It's just fair, period. It's, it's, this, is, this is silly. And this is like Meredith, you said before, we, we keep coming up with this now. We need to sit down uh, and coordinate things across the town a little better. I have a quick question. This is not something, I mean, people aren't living in these rooms all year round. This Mostly is, not. We have a few people who do, but it's But seasonal. for the most part, it's seasonal. That's correct. And, the, and there's very good illumination light. And the thing is, it's not their fault. Right. They built it according to the code. But I can see what someone has to do something right away between the building department and the health department. Because coming down the road, there's going to be a lot more of this unless we get this thing settled. But yeah. I, I don't see forcing them to do what they have to do if they 
recently jumped by the coat. Right. It's a rock and a hard place between the two coats. Uh, you know, this is kind of the direction the state guided yeah, but it's, us. It's in, more than like, just this this one thing we're talking about now. I mean, we're looking at how many commercial buildings in the building. Well, it goes to residential it's, as well. I mean, it's any um, uh, landlord tenant situation. So. So, do we have a motion? So, what what are we looking for? They need a, a variance. Variance. Hmm? A variance from the eight percent right. natural light. So if you were to force a change, what would it entail? Oh, tens of thousands of dollars. This is the foundation of the building. A mess. The codes have changed in terms of glass. It would be a big deal. How much is there? How much light is there now? There I'm going to guess is, well, first of all, in the state code, we have tons of illumination light, and then each room has a window. It's just, it's not as large as these windows. It's probably slightly less than half. Madam Chair. Yes. I move we approve the variance. Can I have a second? Yes, I second it. So he moves to approve the variance. I'll second. And just oh, did. She did? Okay. What is your vote? Um, um, yes. Yes. And? Yes. Malcolm? Yes. Aye. And I say aye. But Thank I you. I still would like to find out that we're going to do something about this. Yeah. I mean, it's out of our control it's locally, not, unfortunately, no. you know, other state codes. So, yeah. You're good to go. You know, actually have a second yeah. part. <laughs> you have a second part? A second part. Oh, oh so, OK. Yeah. So the, the second part of our request, talk about rock and a hard place. Um, for all the years, we have always paid our fees promptly to the Board of Health. And this year, uh, we were one day late and paid on January 2nd because it was, it was a holiday. And we were penalized four times at a $2,000 premium. And in fairness, there was a perception from the Board of Health that we had been told the year before that we were late and that we had one year, but don't do it again. But we were not late the year before. And I pulled up the check, was paid on December 30th, and brought to the Board of Health. So we've never had this before. And our request is that we aren't penalized the four times penalty for the one day delay in making the payment. Comments from the board? Sounds okay to me. So we're yeah, wa waiving the penalty? I mean, that's what's on the board, yeah. I mean, this is something we were consistent about this past year. Um, encouraging folks to come in to the office earlier to, you know, schedule inspections and, um, you know, be in compliance. I think a few months ago we had another uh, in that uh, had operated without a permit two summers in a row and, you know, we had to try and enforce that and bring that one into compliance as well. So um, there were several across the board that we held to that standard. Um, I'm going to be honest, I think it'd be a little tough to go back with finance and try and get a refund. I don't know how that would work. I mean, it doesn't mean we can't do it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, people need to come in the office and schedule inspections and pay for everything prior to operating. So Malcolm? You find people. Yes. Yeah, if Mr. Snyder is correct, and in fact, they did pay the year before on time, I, I think this is a little excessive uh, penalty. And I would support a refund. I can see if it were January 15th or February 1st, but January 2nd, when the first was a holiday, I have to say I agree with Malcolm. It seems very excessive. My question is, did you get the notice in time? 
Uh, we have always paid promptly. We have always received notices. Uh, unfortunately for us, there was a little confusion in our own office. We had our New Year's event, and it was overlooked by the day. So I take responsibility, but for 12 years we paid promptly. We will continue to pay promptly. And in fairness to what John said, we've never tried to circumvent Board of Health laws and not conform to everything you want us to do. Well, my position is he says he's fine to all the other people that didn't make it on time. So you can't give all that money back. And you can't let him off the hook. I think operating two summers yep. without paying versus not paying for one day I know. I, okay. is a little is a little in my in my opinion that's a little different. Okay. I don't know, but it's up to if anyone wants to make a motion. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion. Well, oh, sorry. Hold on. I'm sorry. In one second, you can. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. So my name is Heather Nardoni. I'm the public health. I'm a public health inspector, but prior I was a public health coordinator. Um, I can confirm that they they did not come in on January second because we had January first off as a holiday. That was our first day coming back. The check may have been made out on that day, um, but the day that we received that check was not January second. We can go back and enter up and check everything. So the we check was deposited that. on January fifth. The bank. Yeah, but you didn't come in on January 2nd. I can show you. On well, the Carlos is the person who did I personally came after Sean told me that I was late. So I was the one that dropped the check. So no one could have inspected on January 1st no, because- they didn't inspect, but I dropped the check and then they came on the 3rd to inspect. Yeah, I gave him email. I have Sean's email. They came on the 3rd to inspect it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, have, we can show when it was deposited through Energov. I obviously don't have that data on me right now, but I, I was there. Very so fine. I'm just Less than an hour. Yes. Malcolm? Uh, well, I don't want to get into trivias, but I think we're talking about days versus the other case where there was an establishment that went two years without a license, I still think this is excessive. I think you sort of have to look at the history. If a person does it or an establishment does it over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and they're in violation year after year after year. But it seems to me that this was an overlook, a mistake. Uh, this organization has always done the right thing. I, I think we should uh, allow this. So, Malcolm, do you want to go on with that motion? I, I just have one question oh. first. Yes. If you vote to let them off the hook, what do you have to do? Return all the money to everyone else? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look back and see what other establishments were in that scenario. I like mean, couldn't the motion days, be but... that They'd have to they're waived appeal. if they are less than 15 days late oh, in well, their payment. We'd really need to go back and, I mean, um, they, they need a permit to operate. I mean, that's... Also, I'd, I'd just like to say, you don't have to issue a refund. We can just apply it to future fees, if that's easier, to make this simple. Yes, Madam Chair, I'll make a motion uh, that Oh, hold, on, hold, hold it for I'm one so, second, because now Jake wants to speak. All right, I'm sorry. I just sorry. can't see what's going on. Hi, uh, Jake Visco, health inspector. Um, I just wanted to clarify. Usually for establishments, when they re-permit, they come in around November, give us payment, and we schedule an inspection for the following year's permit. So that's really the time frame when people come in. They don't generally ask for an inspection at the new year while they're already operating just to we're happy to comply but we're the only one open <laughs> so our life is a little bit different and we're happy to comply earlier if you'd like us to okay. malcolm 
I have been convinced to change my opinion. This is an establishment that's done a lot for the island, has been a good citizen, has usually complied, and compared to other organizations, they have usually follow, almost always follow the rules. So I will make a motion uh, that the Nantucket Hotel is waived uh, future payments uh, up to the up to the point of what they paid for in January twenty four. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that fine? John, is that okay? Um I'd have to look into payment and all that, but yeah, I mean we can try and figure that out on, on paper and everything. Um yeah, we can look into that. I mean anyone would need to appeal that was, you know, had something put on them so we wouldn't be going back through past other establishments that were late. They well, he's saying them. just them because yeah, just they this, have a this good history of not doing this. Right. And they are the only people open that time of year. Um, is there a second? I second. All in favor? No. No? Mr. Cooper says no. Anne? I say yes. Malcolm? Yes, I. And I'll say yes. Thank you very much. We will be very prompt this year. <laughs> Next up, 17A Macy or uh, Mary Ann Drive, variance request from the natural light requirement. Is there anyone here for that one? Uh, oh, let me check uh, our attendance here. Okay, I have Anthony's here. Are you there, Anthony? Can you hear me? Hello, hello? Yes. Can you hear me? I don't I don't know if the video is popping up or, or not. I I apologize if not. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um so yeah, we also have uh we're requesting a variance to the natural light requirement similar to the Nantucket Hotel. Um, this situation for us began in late January. Um, there was a, an issue with a resident living as a two bedroom apartment. An issue with the resident living in there that um, they had they had no heat. They were calling the wrong number to report it to us. They called the police. The police responded and it resulted in the health department, fire department and building department all coming out. Um, they did find a few issues in February uh, that we had uh, some ventilation, um, the window wells we were required to do work on to widen them for fire safety. Uh, of course, we understand that. Um, and just a few things that we had fixed within probably five days. Uh, we spent about $30,000 to fix those, to widen the window wells, to add new ventilation, better ventilation to the kitchen, to the bathrooms, um, to the dryer that's in the unit, to add fireproof um, sheetrock to areas around the water heater that was all done within five days uh, the last remaining item that we had to complete was there was a natural light requirement of eight percent um, the way that the two bedrooms are, are split there's a wall divided you can see it in this picture right here there's a wall that divides the rooms where there's a left hand side and a right hand side that wall's open there's no door it's about three quarters of the length of the room that one window lights both. There's, there's one in each room, same layout. That lights both rooms. Uh, at the time that you can see this this window in the middle behind the dresser, that was not there. It was just a wall. So what the health department wanted to see us do was to add more natural light so that it met the requirement. Eight percent. What we did to to do that, and we've done it with the other buildings that we have was to essentially add that window in that middle wall, which is about 15 square feet as a transom, since light's refractive, it comes in through the window there, and then it goes through that other window to light the bedroom. Uh, we were told that that was not good enough. It would not count that the only thing, the only option that we had at that point was to cut into the foundation and widen the, the windows in each room. Even though you can see in that photo that there, there is, there did add, if you look at all the photos on that page, that window did add plenty of sunlight to the next room. The resident is extremely happy. I have a statement from him saying that he's happy. And he's asking that 
this be put behind him at this point. He's been very cooperative so far, but now having to go in and basically use a, a saw to cut the concrete in the foundation will just cause a, a huge disturbance to him. So he's asking that we don't do it, which is why we then applied for the variance. What we were told additionally is if for whatever reason, this window here wouldn't fit, if we didn't have enough space to make it the 8% the that's required, then we could it, it, stay on that. If you'll stay on that last photo, can you go back to that last one real quick? Thank you very much. Where that picture is through the window, they said, the health department said we can basically cut another hole, dig, cut another hole in the foundation there, add a window to, to meet the requirement. I said, well, that wouldn't really solve the problem because if you take away the window that we added in the middle, that bedroom's still dark, even if we add a window, a second window to that room. And they said it didn't matter. Essentially, if if the sun, if the window is directly, um, if the window is directly pointed at the sun and the sun is shining in that window and it's lit up, perfectly because that window square feet doesn't meet the square feet of the room it it doesn't matter so that's what we were left with that we have to cut into the foundation and that's why we're requesting the variance because we don't think the the risk of cutting into the foundation or the trouble that this is going to cause the disturbance to the tenant is worth a couple extra square feet of, of window space when we added a window that he's already very happy with Comments from staff? Uh, from John? Yeah, another situation of a basement apartment with bedrooms that you know don't meet the 8% natural light. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the whole floor area in front of me and the, the percentage of the window. Um, you know, it's unfortunate not to have the 8% natural light, I think, um, especially down in a basement. Um, you know, I'm not too sure actually what the window in the middle really accomplished in regard to outside light coming into the the, the bedroom. Um, but again, it's there is it, it's another case of the building department inspecting it and then in passing it. Well. In my opinion, the the floor plans that I found in the building department files said that this basement was for storage and mechanical space. So I don't know that this was ever really completely permitted for habitable space um, based on the floor plans and everything I read in the building file. Uh, the certificate of occupancy said seven bedrooms in this uh, duplex unit, which actually this basement apartment would kind of make it a triplex, I suppose. Um, there's uh, th three bedrooms in the first floor and four bedrooms on the fourth floor um, or third floor uh, apartment of this and then two two bedrooms down here in the basement uh, the certificate of occupancy in the building files has seven bedrooms so this would obviously make nine so um, and the floor plan stated this was storage space so I'm not sure how this turned into living space um, I didn't see that in the building file. Well, it seems like we have two problems. Then. It's not just a light problem. It's a unauthorized use of space problem or something. I don't know what the right word is, but that type of thing. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's, it's. Do you know who's permitted? If you've got a permit to do that. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Anthony. Sorry about that. So, so this was inspected with the health department and fire department on February 5th in the building with the building inspector, the building inspector found no problems with the unit or else he would have shut it down. Same with the fire department. The health department was the only one that did. We purchased the property like this, uh, at which point it would have been inspected by the fire department when we purchased it to get it approved for purchase. And this resident specifically has been living there for 10 plus years. Um, the resident on the first floor and the one above that, they've been living there for 20 years apiece, and they said this work was done probably 18, 19 years ago. So we purchased it as is with the current resident in there as is. Everything's been approved um, with the exception of the natural light, which is what we're requesting the variance for right now. Right. So, um, yeah, it's not in the building file that this was really, you know, livable space uh, you know again it was storage space uh 
you know, I think we're kind of, this is kind of the opposite end of the stick. Uh, if the health department goes in and does an inspection and finds everything to be in compliance with the housing code, that's where we, our inspections stop there, whether it's permitted or not. Um, but, you know, so that we're here for the 8% light is really why we're here. I just, you know, I don't know how this turned into livable space. Any more comments from the board? Malcolm? I have to think about it. <clears throat> Is the reason that it's so space? light because the light, there's flood lamps on or something in there? Because it sure looks pretty light to me. So I've been in way more ba a lot of basement apartments that are less light than this. So they installed uh, mirrors on the side of the wall, the window well, um, I guess, to reflect, refract light or reflect light into the. Um, How many windows or bedrooms or whatever it is, is, are we talking about here? It's a bit of a odd arrangement. So you have this dividing wall right here. Um, which is kind of splitting a bedroom. Uh, it's, there's no door there uh, to separate the two bedrooms, if you call it two bedrooms. Uh, there was another bedroom. There was beds in both of those areas uh, during the inspection. Um, you know, it's a, whether you call that two bedrooms or I don't know, it's a partition wall. I suppose it's probably two bedrooms, and the, the room on the right-hand side technically doesn't even have a window, so uh, that'd be lack of egress as well. Uh, two bedrooms. Two bedrooms. The walls. The walls open there. Uh, two bedrooms. One exterior window in each bedroom, and one of these fifteen square foot windows in each in each bedroom. Now, the window there. We were told by the fire department, and even everyone and everyone approved it for an egress. And once we widened the um, the window well, it was approved for an egress. Okay. My question is, is it two bedrooms or four bedrooms? Two bedrooms. Malcolm has this end up. Malcolm. Go ahead, Malcolm. Well, if there may, I agree there seems to be enough light there. And if some of the light is uh, from mirrors, mirrors, some of that light is natural light. If so score, I don't know how you calculate the 8%. Sorry. I don't know how you calculate how much light is 8% and how much is not natural light. If you if you scroll up a little bit with the photos, I took photos with the lights off too, because this one's clearly with the lights on. But if you go up a couple of them. That's lights off, and then the next one up is also lights off. So are, are we sure this is less than 8%? That looks pretty light to me. Yeah, so the calculation is based on the square footage of the floor area to the amount of glass. So if you have a 100 square foot room, you need uh, a window two feet by four feet to equal four square feet there, wow. or eight square feet. Not doing the math, just looking at it, it looks yeah. bright to me. And what so. I was told is that, it, again, if it, if it was pointed directly at the sun and the whole room was lit up, because the square feet of that window doesn't quite meet the 8% of the total square feet of the, the room, that it wouldn't count. So it just oh, seems... That's, I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry. That sounds silly to me. The point is the room is lit. My concern of anything in the basement is egress. And uh, I have no problem with granting this variance. I think we're getting silly here. <clears throat> Does anyone want to make a motion? I, I just have one more question. Yeah. If this was done through the building department with a permit, and it was inspected, and everybody passed it, then I think the guy's okay. I mean, because obviously the building department didn't tell him 
that they use one number for lighting and that the health department uses a separate thing. So how are people supposed to know? Just in the codes, yeah, you know. It's, it's, it's in the, it's, but it's not in the building code. Right, it's, yeah, it's, it's see, different that's where the in the building lies. code. Yeah. That, I mean, this is a big problem. It is for Nantucket, with the amount of basement apartments but, we but have. But yeah. my question is, how can you blame this guy if he did everything according to the building code? Well, it doesn't sound like this apartment was meant to be there. Is that correct? We're not, we're not blaming it. Yeah. I know that's just, not why we're know. here, but it doesn't sound like it was approved as an apartment. Except the fire department yeah. approved, the building department approved, approved, everybody approved. The light. Everything. Well, whoever. I mean, if someone looks at a set of building plans, and the build department, the building department should know whether the windows are big enough or they're not. And if they okayed the thing, even though they weren't, you can't blame this guy because if they inspected it and said everything's okay, then I would do the same thing the guy did. If, you know, it's up to the building department to say, wait a minute, those you don't have enough light in those windows. Okay, but if the maybe the building department doesn't even know. About the eight percent for yeah. the health code. Well, we've been in contact with. Oh, each so other. now yeah. they know. Yeah, I think it. Right. It also sounds like this building is permitted for seven bedrooms, and there are nine bedrooms, which is not why we're here. But so right. they came in and said, "Oh, yeah, everything looks great." Not necessarily maybe looking at how many bedrooms it was permitted for. Yeah, is that is that correct? That's what I would say at that at that point in time. Yeah. I feel that sure that we start on this, we have opened a huge can of worms because I have been personally in some lovely basement apartments that I can promise you have less light than this. And we all know that there are many spaces that are being used not quite as they were permitted or coded or whatever to do. And I really think, I agree with Malcolm and stuff, we are really opening a huge can of worms if we start saying we're going to inspect every single basement apartment for, is it 8% or 6% or whatever, based on square footage code, you know, does it comply to the code? And we're going to do a lot of people, a lot of damage who are living safely. So I, I recommend, I make a motion that we permit this variance. Second. All in favor? Aye. Ann? Yes. Malcolm? Aye. I'll say aye. Thank you. We do. We have a big problem here. It's hard with the basements on. Yeah. I mean, up in beautiful yeah. $20 million houses where they have a movie theater in the basement. There's not a window in the room. But it's not a bedroom then. Yeah, it's not a bedroom. Um, so next up, Act Surf School, variance request for recreational camp. Hello, I am Gavin Norton. I'm the owner of Act Surf School. I'm here for the variance request for... Can you speak up a little? Mark? Sorry. I'm here for the variance request for an infirmary, first aid supplies, portable water, and a hand washing sink for a surf school surf camp. So first things first, I do have first aid supplies. I'm first aid trained. Um, I'm also signed up to be lifeguard certified trained, AED, first aid, CPR, everything, which the only thing I don't have is lifeguard training because I have additional training that doesn't need me to be lifeguard trained, but obviously for the state requirements, I need it. So I'm complying with that. Um, portable water, I'm at the beach in a truck with a trailer. I can bring bottled water if needed. I'm more than happy to supply water if that's okay. Um, also know supplying water, you usually need some sort of a food permit. So I've just never brought water to the beach because I didn't want to get in trouble for that. Um, I'm looking to be in compliance in whatever way I can. 
Um, medically, I will reach out to a doctor for the training. I just wanted to do all of this first. I know Dr. Lepre will do it. Um, there's other people that will also do this. So I'm trying to comply in any way. Hand wash, um, that to me, I understand it's in the code, but we're at the beach. I have hand sanitizer. I got a, met, I got a health department inspection during COVID from somebody that's no longer on the board. They've retired since. And I was passed there. I had hand sanitizer, towels, whatever needed. And that was during COVID-19, which was a pandemic. Um, so the fact that now it's an issue that I don't have a hand washing station just kind of boggles my mind a little bit. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a sur uh, they offer surf lessons on the, the beach. Um, and they, it, you know, they meet the definition of a code by the number of children that uh, participate uh, every day uh, based on the the website and lessons for signing up and everything. Um, this is just for camp though, not for lessons. My lessons have nothing to do with this variance. So yeah, so if you have uh, was it five, five children a day for longer than two hours, then you, then you meet the definition of a recreational camp. Yeah, but I'm not, you're saying lessons. Lessons are one hour, one-on-one. -on -one. So it's, it's also tolling, you know, so if you're, have five or more in a day, you meet the definition of a camp. But it's only for one hour at a time? Yeah. All right, so this is all news to me. This had nothing to do with what I was here for. This yeah. is just for the camp of Monday through Friday, nine to 12. The private lessons is a different thing. It still meets the definition of a camp when you look in the, the definition for recreational camp. So, and totally even different. if you are a camp, you're gonna, you know, we'll have to meet the minimum standards on what's on the screen now. So I've also, I'm gonna add, I've been doing this since 2009 when I was 18 years old. So this is the first time this has ever been brought up to me. There's other people that also do this for way longer than me. Cool. So I think probably in the past, it's been uh, with the understanding that it was a drop-in basis scenario, which is what is allowed by the camp code. Um, it exempts you from meeting the definition of a camp is when you operate solely on a drop-in basis. I've never been a drop-in basis. It's okay. extremely, for me, if I was a drop-in basis, I wouldn't operate, it's not safe. I wouldn't be able to plan accordingly. You know, weather, waves, you know, there's other things that cancel lessons. And if it was a drop-in basis, it'd be mayhem. Um, it wouldn't be a viable business if it was drop-in. Um, so, I mean, I've gone through all the training to do all this properly. I'm one of the only people in the Northeast that has the specific training and my surf school is accredited through it. Um, none of this complies with what I would learn through them, which I'm obviously I'm here to try and comply with any variance. The lessons part is news to me, which if you guys were to shut that down, you're shutting down a business that's been running for 16 years. I would not run on a drop in basis. It's not safe. My biggest thing is safety. We're at a beach with waves, kids. There's a lot of liability. I have a ton of insurance. I have workers comp. I have a lot of employees. They all have to be trained. Uh, for me to go to a drop-in basis just wouldn't be viable. Um, I mean, this is obviously catching me off guard because that's not what I thought I was here for. So the fact that that's being brought up is like without my knowledge, I was being told about the camp, nothing about group lessons or private lessons. I've prided myself on never being drop-in. We do offer walk-up lessons. It happens. I have employees. If they want to take their lunch break off and someone walks up or if we have a cancellation, we do it. I mean, there's two surf schools legally on Nantucket. There's a lot more offered. Um, we've always run on a very strict way. You know, we have dates of operation, which I have to abide by. I have regulations I have to abide by. I've gone above and beyond what's asked of me to get certified on different occasions. 
I'm NSSIA certified. The only other person in Massachusetts that has it is my manager who's been working with me for eight years. So we are the two people that have it. We're both able to teach other instructors how to do it. Um, we don't let anybody in the water until they're trained or passed. I mean, I bring people on all the time and don't bring them in as employees. I don't care if you're six, six and you swim at Harvard, if you don't know how to read the ocean, you're not going to work for me. It's something that I've always kind of said, and it's something I stand by. So if it goes to a standby <coughs> drop in lesson, I, you know, I have a bunch of employees. If they have to just stand there and we hope people show up, it's not going to work. I'm not going to have a business and you know, there goes a 16 year business run by a local. Does anyone from the board have, oh. I do too. Yeah. Would someone go closer to the microphone, please? I'm here now. I'm just wondering if you can interpret the um, definition for rec recreational camp for children, because all it says is serves five or more children who are not members of the family. It doesn't say for how long, it doesn't say individually or consecutively or anything like that. So I'm just wondering how his one off lessons turned into a camp and how this might affect a lot of other programs on the island. Yeah, so we asked the state that. Um, Carrie Wagner from uh, Community Sanitation, um, who handles recreational camps for children. Um, and that's how she explained it to us. That was one of our questions that we did ask, um, which we, we didn't know in the office as far as one hour lessons, you know, accumulating to, to meeting that five um, children per day threshold, uh, meeting the definition of a camp. So um, that's the information we received from the state. Madam Chair, may I ask two, uh, two questions? <clears throat> yes, please. I just I have problems when something has been going for 16 years and all of a sudden uh, we have problems with it but it appears to be being run extremely professional. And I go back to, I, I missed the last question who was speaking about the definition of a camp. Are, are, is it, are we interpreting the definition or is it just written, in, written somewhere and not somebody's interpretation of what is written? It seems and like now, now I'm getting confused and I hate to do that. Well, it seems like we're letting the writing lead to interpretation, which I'm going by what's written. And now I'm hearing about something in live time that I wasn't told about. I reached out to people in the health department before this, just making sure that I was aware of what was going on. I have in front of me what was denied. Nothing was brought up about this. I mean, if you're going to shut me down, you're shutting down two local businesses. If I know that no surf school is going to be able to run in this. I mean, I know even the illegal surf schools won't be able to run with this. This is going to shut down kids surfing on Nantucket for good, this, which would be tough. To add in to what Gavin's yeah, saying. Oh, sorry. This, my name is John Beery. I own Next Level Water Sports. Um, so I've appeared before you guys now before. Um, this is bigger than just the surf schools. So the interpretation of these rules, these rules are written specifically to be all encompassing and capture so many different businesses where kids come in. Included in these rules is Nantucket Community Sailing. It's my business, which is run for nine years. I'm not a local like Gavin, um, but Nantucket Community Sailing, both surf schools and ourselves. And I wish Diana Brown was here as well. This is a discussion over the future of opportunity for kids on Nantucket to learn to be in the water and have fun and learn how to be safe. Um, and these rules are all encompassing within them. There's a definition of primitive camps and the surf schools, Nantucket Community Sailing and myself all share a commonality in that we operate on the water, which is inherently primitive. We are out on the water away from formal facilities and no one owns the water. So it's impossible to have a waterfront facility or a facility on the water. So it makes it extremely hard to meet these rules. So under the primitive camp guidelines, they allow boards of health to issue variances and work with different
companies on, a, on an as-needed basis um, and leave, leave it up to each town to make a decision. We all operate in this primitive environment and this is a significant decision because if we can't grant variances and authorize our businesses to operate, unless you're a millionaire child who is, whose parents are members at Great Harbor Yacht Club or Nantucket Yacht Club, you are not gonna have the opportunity to learn to sail. There's gonna be no more opportunity for kids to learn to survive in heavy surf. And then for my business, we're teaching kids boating safety, the same things that I wanna teach my own children. We're teaching kids how to operate motorboats, how to be safe on the water, as well as do water sports. So I've interviewed numerous other camps in Massachusetts. The rules accommodate for whitewater rafting, there are camps that go hiking in the backcountry, all occur, like on the Appalachian Trail for weeks. There's precedent of approved camps operating in primitive environments. We are at our core, those camps, and we all, like I apologize for submitting another book, but we are the safest people out there. And we're trying to operate by the rules and we just wanna work with the Board of Health to come to a resolution so we can keep kids safe. Madam Chair, I, I will repeat myself. To me, these seem like, by that definition, primitive camp. So we're back to interpretation of the rules. I have no problem with these camps operating as they have for a significant amount of time, contributing to the island, teaching our youth to be safe, and all done by very professional people. Can I ask exactly what needs to be done to comply with what seem to be the regulations? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, an, I'm not totally clear about that. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things. There's uh, storage of medication for children, uh, administering medication for yes. children, um, you know, hand washing toilets, uh, <laughs> infirmary uh, potable water um, you know we have plenty of organizations on the island that go through uh, the code and meet all the uh, definite all the requirements of a camp you know there's many organizations which do this you know um, Can you I know, say waste one receptacles um, I do think some of the camps some of the camps actually use these organizations so even if we said no you can't do it the kids from the camps that are approved would still be going to these camps for that three hour time period so they what we would be doing is really not very much does that make sense like when i learned that they're going and i understand it's water safety i grew up here i didn't go to any of these camps and I still figured out how to go swimming in the waves. So I don't think that that's necessarily, that that's necessary. However, I do think they've all been operating. And if you look, I did a lot of reading because Next Level's packet was 120 pages. And the packet here, I mean, it says a recreational camp for children means any day primitive or outpost residential sports tra travel or trip camp conducted wholly or in part for recreation or recreational instruction, which, and then there's, you know, operates for profit or philanthropic or charitable purposes, serves five or more children who are not members of the family or personal guests of the operator and operates for any period of time between June 1st and September 30th of any year or fewer than 15 business days during other, any other time of the year or Number two is any person, entity, or program that promotes or advertises itself as a camp, even if it does not meet the criteria listed above. That's the definition. Right. Are you, you're looking, I sent you the 2024, March 2024. Mm -hmm. March 1st, 2024. Yeah, and you're reading, is that the scope section? That's recreational camp for children. Um, I also 
Primitive or outpost camp means a portion of the permanent camp premises or other site at which the basic needs for camp operations, such as places of abode, water, supp water supply systems, and permanent toilet or cooking facilities may not be provided. Yeah, so the guidance we received back from the state was a primitive camp is more wilderness survival skill type of a camp. Um, that's what primitive is going camping. That's when a bathroom or water is not provided. Um, as far as the other camps attending the surf lessons or um, that would be a field trip, which they need to be approval for. Um, if they're going to a bathing beach, it needs to be uh, a bathing beach that is uh, tested by the health department for bacteria, uh, a permitted beach. So um, that would so, be for swimming and bathing. So nobody here is tested by the town. It also has town lifeguards. That's correct. You'd still need a lifeguard for your uh, program. Which I'm going to be. And my insurance for the last 16 years has never told me I needed to be a lifeguard, um, which I, again, I'm trying to abide by the rules. I'm also going by my insurance company that's never told me I have been needed to be one. I have been one in the past. I've re-upped it. I've also let it lapse just because I was running a restaurant for seven years as well. Didn't really have time to go redo it, but I'm willing to, and I've already signed up and paid for the community pool lifeguard, whatever. Um, I mean, the primitive camp thing, I guess, is again, in for however you want to read it. I've read the same thing and the town hasn't, or the state hasn't come to me and read that to me in the way that you have. I would say that I'm kind of a primitive camp. We're not going camping. We're going out into the ocean. We're going away from where we meet. Everything is safe. I don't overload the water. The waves are too big. I cancel. Jake Visco worked for me we would cancel all the time. You know, I'm a safe person. We've never had issues. I've helped with issues. I've helped people in general. There didn't used to be lifeguards at Nobodier. I asked the town if we could put lifeguards at Nobodier because I was stopping my day to go help them. I also rent from the town. So this is all things I submit to the town. I give the town my attendance when they ask for it. It's broken down by morning and afternoon. I've complied with absolutely everything. So coming up here thinking I'm just asking for variants for camps, but now I'm kind of being blindsided by lessons. If I hadn't shown up today and this wasn't granted, I would have gotten an email notification saying that my business was done. So I'm just, it's just a little concerning for me that like we're all saying, I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. As a senior in high school, started this business. I've always done it the right way. I've never stepped on toes. I've always asked for permission rather than forgiveness. So this is just something to me that's a little bit of a shot in the dark and it's like I'm a local business that's been doing this for kids. I've raised my price twice in 16 years. So I'm trying not to help price and outdo anything. I still have a full-time job. This isn't making me rich. Um, I do it more for kids, people visiting. It's a uh, it's a good thing that gets people outside on Nantucket. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're a beach community. So you did file an application for a camp in the office? I did, yes. Okay, all right. So that's why, you know, we received this information, so. Yeah, but now we're bringing up the private lesson bit, which didn't have anything to do with this. I'm doing this to go on file because the last time this was brought up, I went to the health department and asked them what I should be doing. And I was told by the person at the health department to change the name camp to session. I said, like, that's gonna cover me for all these things. She said, yes, the word camp will get you in trouble. Just change it to session, change it to whatever. I left the office, I did that. Didn't really offer it too much. I'm more of a private lesson, group lesson. That's what takes up a lot of my time. So I was advised by the health department to just change my name rather than comply, ask for variants or do it the correct way. I'm now here because shame on me for not doing it the right way and being told by the health department to do something else. Um, so now I'm just trying to make sure that I'm doing it the correct way to avoid if anything is to change that this affects my private lessons because that's the majority of my, my business, which now it seems like is in jeopardy from something that nobody ever told me. 
And if I didn't come here today, would that have not been an issue? Are you guys going to every single surf school and letting them know this? Or is this just going to be a cease and desist July 1st? Sorry, this is Emma Conway again from Great Harbor. It wouldn't just be surf schools. If you're talking about five kids throughout the day, it would be tennis lessons, golf lessons. It would be any of the other recreational programs on the island that might serve five kids throughout the day. So I think we should maybe take a look at that definition again and think about more five at a time than five throughout yeah. the day. Mer Merith, could I ask you a question to, to John? Yes. I mean, if you read the definition of primitive camp, it's pretty simple. And you're quoting from uh, someone at the state with their interpretation of it. Yet, shouldn't it, the law essentially says the Board of Health has the right to make that interpretation. So we're, we're, we're not, we're talking against each other here. I mean, these are primitive camps. Are we going to put an infirmary at the ocean side? That's crazy. I think I think we're going down the wrong direction here. These are established learning experiences that have been that are done, as I said before, by people who have done it before. They know what they're doing, and now after all this time, we're making an issue out of definitions and someone in the state telling you what they think a primitive camp is. I, I'm sorry, I, I disagree with the, the way we're going here. So, yeah, I think these would fall under the definition of a sports camp. Um, but this is all kind of... It's, a, it's a sports camp. I mean, come on. We're, uh. So, can, can I add to that? So, the primitive camp aspect, it, like, you can be a primitive sports camp. The primitive, in the definition, the definition of primitive camp only addresses facilities. It does not address where uh or it does not address the type of camp it just says do you have facilities or not it doesn't say anything about wilderness education going purely off the definition it's just referencing the physical infirmary the landline like we don't have those actual facilities these are education so we're, facilities we're, that don't have facilities period so i think we should get on to make a decision because we're just we're talking in circles here and we're we're just doing one of them right now, correct? Correct. We're, yep. We're just doing AxServe School, which doesn't have an infirmary, or infirmary, but has a lifeguard there, has a lifeguard on the beach. I. It's a three-hour camp, correct? Yeah. I mean, I'm currently not offering it, but yes. It would be a three-hour camp. Yeah. So it is not a camp that, and I'm not trying to get particular here, but this is not a camp where a parent is going to drop their kid off for the day and say, I'll pick you up at five, like a camp that, like a lot of other camps on the island. I don't wanna single anyone out. Um, this is a camp where the parent is probably nearby. So I, I, I also will add in, I cap it off at 15, that's my max. I hardly ever max out. I have three employees that are there every day for it. If it goes to 15 people, I usually add more. If the waves and the weather are going to be bad, I add more. I lose <coughs> money on this camp some weeks because I've always prided myself. My guys that have worked for me will always pride that I would rather go on the side of safety than making 90 bucks. It's not worth me injuring a kid or having someone's life at danger. For money so it's just something to me that you know i've always helped rather than hurt the waterfront so you know looking at this as an infirmary and as first aid you know i probably give just as much first aid on the beach as the lifeguards do because i'm more convenient i'm right at the entrance everyone can see me the lifeguard station at nobody here cars park around it it's hard to see i know where it is everyone in my camp knows where it is all my employees know where it is they know where i am they know how to call 911. I always have an employee up at the truck. We have mobile Wi Fi. I have Starlink at the beach that runs off a generator. And I've made sure that all these things are possible to, for safety. No one asked me to do this. No one made me do this. I did all this on my own as a responsible business owner. And now I'm trying to do the right thing. And it's just kind of, I understand that I need these things. And I'm here trying to make sure I can do them to the best of my ability. 
the hand wash facility, my landlord's the town of Nantucket. If they want to put in permanent bathrooms and hand washes, I would love that. I have to look at porta potties all day long and trash that gets overfilled. I clean the beach. I put the trash in the trash cans. I do all this stuff at the place that I'm not meant to do it. I could sit there and watch it or I could fix it. So I've always been a good tenant. It didn't used to always be through the town. It used to be through the airport. Um, I think I've gone above and beyond most of the other seasonal businesses that are at the beach, especially on the South shore. No offense to these guys. I'm not calling them out. You no, know, I show up, I pay my rent. I pay everything that I'm asked to do. You know, I have other people pull up to the beach, offer the exact same thing I do without insurance, without liability, without permission. And, you know, I've never called and thrown them under the bus. I'm just here doing it. Would you like more guidance from the state, from Kerry? I mean, well, I think Malcolm, it. is your hand up? I just think we need to uh, move on and vote and decide what we're going to do. Yeah, I mean, I think oh, I think we've heard all all the various arguments, and we're just cycling again. It's time for us to make a decision about well, what we're going to do. In in terms of uh, more guidance from the state, I think we're, that is a little bit because by definition. Some of these type of camps, because of the sports <coughs> that they are involved in or teaching or whatever, it's going to be impossible for them to comply. They, ha they have to be considered a primitive camp. I would go out and say that. Even any... though you're not, you know, hiking 50 miles into the wilderness. Uh, mm -hmm because of the of the sport now certain sports if you didn't have these facilities mm -hmm. you really would be in violation because they'd be close enough to something that you would need to have them i mean if the ocean's not considered primitive it changes every day it changes every <laughs> year this isn't a soccer field sometimes it's wet sometimes there's a hole in it i mean sometimes there's a seal sometimes there's a crab jellyfish shark sandbars change everything changes this is primitive. We're at the beach. It's it's not a sport. There's not a sports team for surfing in most places. Whitewater rafting, that's considered a sport. Kayaking, it's in the Olympics. Surfing's down in the Olympics. So now it's becoming a sport where before it was primitive. We're at the beach. You know, I have to bring everything that I operate through. So if this isn't primitive, I don't know what is. Obviously, a soccer camp isn't primitive. They're playing soccer. This is surfing. We're out in the ocean. We're out in nature it's you know there's risk and that's why i do everything i can and i don't think having a hand wash is gonna affect this it's, we're out in the ocean so maybe we do need some more guidance from the state or maybe we do need to go to the state i don't know whether this is even a possibility john but uh to say hey we've got these quote camps uh, operating quite safely but they're not able to i mean what would the what would we how would we handle that is that possible yeah we can do that i can be in touch with carrie and um you know i'm sure she'd be happy she presented to us we had we came up with all these questions with her we had a webinar with her um you know asking many of these questions the lessons was a surprise to us the one hour lessons and the the tolling um you know making five kids in a day a camp um you know i think yes, a primitive I, i'm sorry still i'm has... sorry to interrupt i don't want to be rude but where is all of that definition written in the law it's all interpretation it's not it's interpretation so okay? if you can ask somebody that said no can i ask somebody else that maybe has a different interpretation right. and there must be thousands thousands of camps in the commonwealth of pennsylvania that don't have infirmaries that are by the water I mean, we're, we're a water state. We're surrounded by water. So I, I, I'm, I'm just still puzzled why we're even here. But uh, so, I, Madam Chair, I, I'm just encouraging us to move on. I agree. Uh, and that, you know, it, you know, if I, I could make us some kind of a motion 
that we grant the variance, providing that the the owner follow his comments that he made in in his uh, paper to us. That that's fine. That's I was that. going to even say we granted a variance for one year to the um, Sconset Caddy Camp. Yes. Right. And then we could get more information, but then we could let the because it's April, and if we continue this for another month. Now we're in May and this is putting all of their businesses in a hard spot. So anyone That's, want to make a motion? I I will make a motion. We grant the variances as requested. For Axe Surf School. For Axe for uh Axe Surf School. Is there a second? I, I'm sorry, but I like the idea of for a period of time okay. that you put in. So, Malcolm, could we adjust that? I will. Continue? I will accept your amendment of one year. Okay, then I second it. With one I'll one, I would just like to comment before we vote. I don't. If I'm still representing the select board and the board of health a year from now, I don't want to have this discussion again. I want this discussion done in August or September and have this resolved. So we're not sitting around two weeks before the start of this season and say, oh, well, maybe we didn't get the right information. Oh, maybe we'll grant another year. So I, I will accept an amendment of one year uh, providing that we resolve all of these questions no later than September of this year. Can I add one thing? Can we have it on the basis that it's not based on interpretation? Because we can leave right here and it's pretty clear which way John is leaning towards this, towards the no, interpretation of one person. That, that's our whole point. Anything is interpretation. But I think but, well, let's just go by the guidelines. I mean, let's sorry. let's just do grant the variance for a year and we will push very hard that we have a really in-depth discussion about this uh, in September, August, September, October. So that we don't keep getting camps coming in here. I, I, yeah, I mean, this is just uh, this. I don't think any of us handled this very well. The so, board hasn't, the health department, no one has. It's, it's, it's just unacceptable to me. So I move the variance. The ex we give the variance for one year. All right, and it's been seconded by Anne. Yes. Yes. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Anne? Yes. Malcolm? Yes. And I say yes. Okay. Next up is Great Harbor Yacht Club. <laughs> Variance request for recreational camp and uh, I'm the healthcare consultant for this yeah. camp. Just so that Mal Malcolm can chair. Yeah, Malcolm, you can chair this one. Uh, okay. Let me put my hand down. Hi there. I'm Emma Conway. I'm the waterfront director at Great Harbor Yacht Club. Uh, we are here seeking a variance today to the requirements for watercraft supervision. The um, requirements from the Commonwealth suggest a lifeguard certification or a couple of other options, but the note also says just gonna pull it up, that there are more comprehensive trainings available that could be accepted by the local board of health, depending on the types of watercrafts and aquatic activity that staff members will oversee. And our program specifically operates around sailing. So my request is that the US sailing level one certification or Irish sailing association uh, certification be granted for our instructors instead of lifeguard certification, because I think it provides them with much better training to be able to keep kids safe in sailboats and around motorboats on the ocean than just a lifeguard training would. There's also precedent of this happening in Manchester by the sea. As well as in Maryland, I included that in my variance packet. They right. uh, granted approval for this there as well. Comments, John? Um, yeah, so actually, uh, Carrie from the state is um, the, that 2023 approval um, 
she says is from uh, is expired um, due to the new code, which was promulgated in March, um, which is more stringent on the lifeguard um, requirement. Um, and she's actually going to ask that that Board of Health rescind that variance. But um, you know, my recommendation is that the lifeguard is is really kind of the gold standard in this scenario. Um, and as well as the the boater safety education certification for uh, the uh, instructors. So as part of U.S. Sailing Level 1 certification, they also need to have a boater safety education card. They aren't granted their certification until they have that. They also take safe sport training and concussion awareness and all that as part of their training. Um, and they're taught very specifically how to rescue individuals from the water be it from a capsize from a person in the water or a person overboard all of that and i i emailed some pages to you guys about that specifically as well so to bring a lifeguard who's used to watching people from a poolside or a beachside floundering in the water without a life jacket and asking them to monitor children in the water around motorboats around sailboats and being able to understand that equipment i don't think is a fair comparison comments from the board U.S. Sailing is the governing body of our sport in the country, right. and they provide the trainings to instructors all over the country. And level one is just the minimum. It goes up to level two and three and program director and all of that. I have signed up for the lifeguard course, and my assistant waterfront director is going to take it as well. But all of our instructors are U.S. Sailing level one minimum or Irish Sailing Association equivalent and are provided with far superior training to keep the kids safe on the water than just a lifeguard certification. From the board, comments, questions? Um, is this the only issue here uh, for the Great Harbor program? This Does is this... all they're applying for at this time, yeah. Uh, did you say you are a lifeguard or there are lifeguards? I've signed up for the town class because okay. I thought, why not? So yeah, one's required for every 25 um, students in the water. I think it seems to me this is a no brainer. And this, it, just to go back to kind of what we were talking about before, but this would also affect some of the other programs on the island who are also US sailing level one. So as, as long as it's okay with the, the town and the Board of Health to see that the US sailing level one certification is going to keep the kids safer than just a lifeguard certification, then that will keep all the other programs in order and safe as well. And you said it was a no-brainer? Well, having been here my entire life and watching my kids be taught sailing and teach sailing, I understand full well what you're saying about the fact that a lifeguard standing on a, in a stand watching people, as you say, foundering in the water is very different than when you have a kid trapped under a boat that's capsized right and that takes special training and special skills right and so i'm not sure that these regulations are particularly relevant do you want Thank to make you, a I motion agree. then Anne? yeah sure i will make a motion to grant a variance for the to approve uh, the U.S. sailing or Irish sailing safety rules. Do we hear a second? Jim? I'll, I'll second. Two seconds. Okay, all in favor, uh, Jim? Jim, you. Are you in favor? Yeah. Yes. And yes. I say aye, variance is granted. Thank you very much. Next up, next level water sports variants from Recreation Camp Cove for Children. Um, how's it going? My name is John Beery, owner of Next Level Water Sports. Um, I know I spoke previously, but here asking for 
12 variances pertaining to the fact that I don't have formal facilities um, in hearing the discussions here today I am assuming I'm probably going to need more variances uh, for instance my staff all of my staff are required to have US Coast Guard captain's licenses which is an extremely intensive certification it requires over 325 hours on the water um, a week-long course going through various various aspects of training boating safety um, navigational skills, everything. Um, so to start, we like we, we've been here repeatedly with you guys. Our goal is to comply with the rules. Last year, we had a meeting with in front of the Board of Health. The instructions coming out of it were a work with the Board of Health. Don't call yourself a camp. Uh, last year, we reached out with the Board of Health repeatedly. I have in writing from them approving our camp and saying let us know when we can come out and observe you on august 1st i reached out to them and said hey come on out we're up and running they didn't respond the next outreach was another cease and desist letter from the board of health so this is the same um discussion as gavin as like act surf school it's the same discussion for emma um we're seeking to operate and we're seeking to provide a camp that keeps kids safe and we've tried the route last year we withdrew our motion for variances um that didn't work we're back here again so now i would like to apply for variances my issue is i haven't been able to have a discussion or meeting with the health department they haven't that they wouldn't even accept my application this year so i'm in a very tricky spot where and again this is ncs this is the surf schools this is myself where we operate in a primitive environment, we are, so Emma has US sailing as their governing body. I teach kiteboarding, I teach e-foiling, I teach some very interesting sports. Um, I also teach boating safety, but we don't have a governing body. And that's why I have a 130 page training manual. Like I apologize for submitting another book. Um, but what we're looking to do is work with the health department, work with the state, and come up with an operating model where we can teach kids boating safety and water sports every summer. And that is our goal. So within this, I have asked for 12 variances. I don't know if it's a complete list. I, I don't know what to do, but our goal is to operate. Um, so that's kind of my case. Yeah, so obviously 12 variances, I think, are up there. No bathrooms, no hand washing, no. These are the same variances for the last few years. Yes. And how, like the ring buoy one, they have stuff on the boat. It's just not a ring buoy. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's safety devices, not specifically a oh. ring buoy. All of our boats are inspected by the Coast Guard. I guess year. that's where I was reading this and I was like, well, you, you actually have something comparable to a ring buoy. Um, they're equipped with a readily accessible US Coast Guard type four throwable and campers are required to wear life jackets during the course of the camp. Yeah, I think the ring buoy, uh, I think, is more for uh, swimming purposes. Mm -hmm. Does anyone? Um, but as well as all the, the other variances, no bathrooms. Do you guys have comments or, John, do you guys have more comments or? we go to the board? I mean, that they're, I'm not sure if, you know, you went through the packet and, and went through these, but um, I mean, again, storage of medication, infirmary, uh, site location, um, telephone, you know, emergency telephone. Um, Can I comment on the telephone? Yep. I, I don't think they, I think all phones are essentially like a landline is 
still sort of acts like a cell phone at this point. And you guys have a satellite phone? We proposed a satellite phone as a workaround because that's what the other camps I interviewed who are in way more remote environments are using. But we have VHF radios, uh, US Coast Guard's accessible on 16 at all times. All my staff are trained on it. We do annual emergency training every single year. Um, so we have multiple avenues to get in touch with emergency personnel if we need to. And we exercise all of our emergency plans annually. Because it like doesn't all. actually say landline. It does actually say landline in the rules. In this, when I was looking at, did not say landline. In the regs, it said the, the regulations are extremely specific and cumbersome. And that, that's where they issue that flexibility around variances to make decisions for the Board of Health and local health departments to say what works. And NCS has the same problem, and they're the best organization on this island. I can't see Malcolm. Malcolm, do you have any comments? My comments are similar in the past, what I said in the other organizations. This whole issue needs to be resolved before next year, and I would support variances for a year. Is that your motion? Uh, if you want, that will be my motion, yes. Is there any more discussion or do... He said a motion for to do a, to accept the variances for one year, and then we can have. No, I'll vote for that. Okay. Okay. Do you have? I'm not going to second that. Do you have? Do you want? Do you have any comments? Well, I, this has been three years. I'm, I mean, the things, everything that we want, they don't have. If you put that list up there again. Yeah, to start with lack of show. Okay. I mean, I can't believe that. I mean, you know, they, they have no emergency medical facility, no hand washing, no toilet facilities. I mean, they're not willing to have any of that. But well, so that there's anybody else of the huh? people right. we've given variances. Pardon to. me. These are the same issues that the other people have uh, that we are, we've given variances to this evening. And this is where the code is also specific around um, primitive camps. So there, it, they specifically address not being able to meet these under the primitive camp exceptions. And that's what we're applying under is that primitive camp exception and saying we're, we're a primitive camp. These are the best practice workarounds we have and there are other uh, there are numerous examples in the state of people approved doing operating in a primitive environment. How long are kids out with you? Three hours. So same as same as Gavin. You know, uh, you know, no shelter. I'm concerned about out of the sun. Um, something Jeez. happens to a child where they go for you know. If they're not feeling well or you know concussion or something of that nature so, so as our workaround for that we keep um a fire retardant tent on site um every single day like we've been operating for nine years successfully without incident um like there's a letter of recommendation from sheila lucy if you look at the letters of reference i included there's one from a mother who acknowledged the fact that we save tons of people on the water every year because of our presence out there. Um, and we, we call the weather every day. And we, we never put people, like, we read the weather every day and we cancel. We're extremely conservative um, when, we, when we make that decision. Like, we, we don't take it lightly. Um, and we've never had an issue in nine years of operation around it. I guess I have to ask a, a uh, question that should be sort of obvious to all of us maybe after all this discussion where do these kids go to the bathroom in the bushes in so, the water what, so what do they do? <laughs> number one we're in the water number two has never been an issue kids are coming out they're potty trained they know what they're coming out for they go to the bathroom and then if there is an issue um like last year we held uh, we purposely bought a slip at the town pier 
to be able to take kids to the town pier to use the facilities there. But to, to answer your question, we've never had an issue with it, um, with number two. And if it was an issue, we have, we have bathrooms downtown that we can easily rip a kid up to the town dock and go use the restroom and let's go back out. Okay. There's also a porta potty in Pulpus. I mean, when a kid has to go, they have to go. So I don't think the town <laughs> town dock is, is no, a great solution. <laughs> no, a hundred percent. So to address that, what, what other? So there's the Leave No Trace Foundation. They are like the national leader of how do we operate without leaving an impact in the environment. Mm -hmm. So as our variants, if you go to our variants for our toilet facility, um, they have these things called wag bags. It's not glamorous. It's okay. a foldable toilet. You can okay. go in the wag bag, dispose it in trash, fine. just like a diaper. Perfect. That's fine for me. I'm okay with that. I mean, I, I just think, and I don't participate in the activities you <laughs> offer, but, um, and maybe they don't sound primitive. However, being out on the water is more of a primitive activity and um, I think, I think by they definition, doing, it's, it's primitive. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think my only question was the storage administration of medications, which I felt like if you had children, I mean, you have Dr. Black, who is wonderful. And so I think that if there were kids that had medical issues, she would be consulted. And she's got a lot of experience. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what they mean by storage. Do they mean a, a cabinet, a box that they put the... Or uh, something like you can put insulin in, refrigerated. Uh-huh. An EpiPen. EpiPen. But they don't need to be re right. refrigerated, just locked right. up. Yeah. That the, doesn't the, sound complicated to me, uh, as long as you have that. It's not complicated. The example of a primitive camp was hiking. This is water. Hiking in this, These are camps are hiking on the water. No difference. Okay, so back to Malcolm's variants. Did he? Yes. I mean, did he? Did he make the motion? He made a motion to approve it for one year. And we just need a second. I second. All in favor? Anne. Yes. Malcolm. Aye. No. Jimmy. No. No. I'm gonna say yes, and hopefully by the fall we can have this sorted out about what a camp is. Thank you very much. Because uh, I think there's a little, this is three organizations, but there are more to come. So many camps on this <laughs> island. And yeah, we permit probably 15 or so Boys and Girls Club, Nantucket Community School, Strong Wings, um, Murray Camp, uh, Mariah Mitchell. Safari girls. So yeah, there are a lot that we do permit. So, just, All right. So I appreciate that. As follow up, I'm just wondering how we proceed with, and this is a question to you guys, um, with how we proceed to getting an operating plan. And because right now we aren't able to market, like we're in limbo, and we haven't been able to do anything um, and get answers and. Like we were approached on February 29th, like two weeks before the deadline. So we're wondering how we get a timely resolution and a clearance to operate, given the variance approval. Well, you were just granted perfect 12 of those yeah. awesome items. So awesome. All right. Thank you guys very much. We appreciate it. Next up, update on the summer house food establishment and lodging. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Yes. Are we going too. to continue with the entire rest of this agenda in as much as it's 625 or uh, what do you think? I don't know. Madam Chair? Yes. I would suggest, <clears throat> I would like to give you a little a PFAS update. And then I suggest that everything else on there can uh, can wait. That's fine. 
That's fine. I would love a PFAS update. I love PFAS. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> not you really. should probably give, you're our PFAS expert. And <clears throat> I'm super excited about the regulations. Well, the regulations, the regulations are moving swiftly. And I think there's been some discussion uh, with within the town recently about kind of getting a grip on it. Things have moved faster than we certainly been able to move fast. The regulations are changing. Uh, the science seems to change at times. Uh, we still don't have a real definite idea of some of the sourcing on this island. And that's really the state is working on. We do have our own regulations about uh, selling your house and so forth. And of course, at any time anybody wants to uh, get testing of their wells, the, they go to the health department and they can get a kit. Uh, it's important that they're done correctly, that the instructions are followed. I think what the town is trying to do now and will come out shortly is kind of a, so what do we do next? You know, we, we find PFAS in our wells uh in our water what do we do and we haven't really given very good instruction or recommendations on that and i think you'll be hearing about that soon so that's i just wanted the board to know and the the town to know that uh we're concerned about the issue and it's 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 quite difficult it's been difficult for us and we admit that we perhaps were a little slow in getting some uh guidance out there but it is coming uh soon and if you have questions if you want your well tested uh the health department will give you a kit and instructions but there's no plan if people test with high numbers after they get tested and I think they're, the if they're high numbers they they need they need to be reported the question what we need to help our citizens do is give them some guidance of what to do if they have a high number. Uh, yeah, I think as, as Malcolm commented, you know, the regulation's been in place for a few months. Uh, we're the first community in the state to go by the state guidelines. Um, and everything's going kind of rapid pace right now. And we're, you know, trying to get guidance out there more information on filtration everything like that so it's um a little bit of catch up right now but we're working at it definitely so um again it's kind of going fast based on the implementation of of that regulation um ahead of anyone else in the state and we're just trying to catch up right now at this point Um, as Malcolm said, we do offer the tests in our office, PFAS tests. They're $265. Um, we have an instructions and everything. Uh, that's Tuesday mornings from 7.30 to 9 in the morning. Uh, samples need to be taken that morning and submitted to our office between 7.30 and 9. Um, so the, the kits are available in our office, as Malcolm said as well. So. Okay. Did you want to do your report or do you? Um, yeah. And then we can. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, I think um, all set, things are kind of just rolling along. We have uh, obviously some PFAS and short term rentals. I think I said all this at the last meeting. So um, definitely a lot of licensing inspections going on right now. So it's, it's definitely busy with food establishments, lodging, camps, uh, pools will be coming up. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then routine food inspections. So, um, but things are rolling along. Uh, Heather, I don't know if I announced the last meeting, but it's our newest inspector. So she's learning a lot very quickly, I think, uh, in the office. Um, Tamika Gary, uh, who was the office manager, was, um, she received the position for public health office, uh, coordinator in our office. So um, she had been in the office for about a year uh, probably not even a year now, but feels like a year. Um, but she's doing a terrific job, so we're happy to have her as the public health coordinator. Um, 
and yeah, we'll keep rolling along. Uh, I could give a quick update on the tick numbers if you wanted to, Malcolm. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. So for uh, 2023, uh, Lyme's disease was 186 uh, number of cases last year. Um, again, those would be uh, reported here on the island for people that live here. So, um, you know, if they were diagnosed here but live in Springfield, Massachusetts, well, it counts as Springfield, Massachusetts. Oh. So, um, so we had 186 for Lyme's. Um, babesiosis, we had 20 in 2023. Um, Anapla. I'm going to struggle with this one. Anaplasmosis, uh, five cases last year. Um, and zero cases of Borrelia maya motai. Oh, gosh, I'm strong. I'm sorry, I'm a little tired, I think, just like you at this point. Uh, zero cases, though, last year. So, um, But I've been in touch with. Um, Leah Hamner, who is our contact uh, epidemiologist, um, she's on the vineyard. Um, she provided all that information. She's, uh, I just met her for the first time on a webinar last week, and she seems to be terrific um, with being able to get us any information we need to. She uh, referred us to uh, a biologist, Patrick, uh, with Martha's Vineyard as well. I'm drawing a blank on his last name, but uh, he's going to be sending along some uh, care packages, more information, and everything that we can pass out at the office. So, and uh, I'll be looking to get more stuff on uh, the town website. Uh, we do have the, the Tick Symposium, which was, I think, 2014 with Dr. Tim Lepre. Um, if you haven't watched that video on the town website, I recommend it. Um, it's, it's very informative and, and shows ways to protect yourself from uh, deer ticks, so, as well as giving more information about them, so. John, are those numbers that you gave us um, for 23 higher or lower than 22, do you know? Uh, 2022 Lyme's disease was 134 cases. Okay. Uh, zero for babesiosis in 2022. Uh, less than five for anaplasmosis. <laughs> I'm okay. struggling. There's more to that. Uh, and zero for Berlia Maya Motoya. I have to watch Dr. Tim Lepre say I was going to say, he knows how to say it. The pronunciation <laughs> of that one. I, I've had that one down, and I have to practice more. But um, that's it on the tech front. Um, I'd definitely like to get more outreach on that and put more on our on town website. Um, there's great stuff on mass.gov as well. So I always recommend people to go to mass.gov and the information on there. Okay. All right. A motion. Motion to, to adjourn. And to do the other, the rest of the agenda next yeah, month. I'm, I think maybe at the beginning of the agenda, we should take the, these last items next month. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Anne? Yes. Malcolm? Aye. Aye. Jim? Aye.